So osmotic pressure is another colligative property, and you're already familiar with osmotic pressure. It's the idea that if I take if I take a, a bacterial cell and I put it into a solution that's say, well, let's make it really salty, one molar sodium chloride. What's going to happen is that when I put this in, the concentration of solute is much higher in this solution out here than it would be in the bacterium. And so the water is going to exit the membrane and we're going to end up with this shriveled bacterial cell and it dies. Okay, uh, so this is the idea that if we have an impermeable membrane, let's draw something more schematic here. And the, the impermeable membrane is going to, it's really semi-permeable, it's, it's going to pass the solvent, but not the solute. So if we have, if we start off with uh, having a solution over here and we have a lot of we have a lot of solute, what's going to happen is that the solvent's going to, going to come over here. And it's kind of the reverse of diffusion because we, we're unable to have the solvent, the, the solute diffuse to the other side. So instead, the solvent comes over and dilutes it. And that makes sense, right? If we, if we look at the initial chemical potential of A on the left versus the right, we can see that you know, the chemical potential is lower over here, right? Remember that the chemical potential of an ideal solution of, the, of component A, the solvent in the ideal solution, is given by this expression. So as soon as this drops below one, as soon as we're impure, we've lowered our chemical potential. So the solvent's going to go over to the side where it's got a lower chemical potential. So that's the basic idea of osmosis. So what we can imagine is building an apparatus that looks schematically anyway like this, where you've got these two little chimneys and we have the same membrane separating the two cells and I have pure solvent over here and I have on this side some more of that solvent but the difference is I'm going to put I'm going to put some some B in here some solute what's going to happen well solvent's going to rush through the membrane and this is going to climb so the, the level is higher over here and of course, it's it's higher that's going to raise a pressure difference equal to rho g h, and so we'll just put pressure difference is equal to rho g h, and so eventually that's going to raise the chemical potential of the liquid on this side so much because it's underneath this pressure difference, which is using the Greek letter p pi uh, for pressure here, that the the solvent will stop rushing. Okay, and so if we look at the two sides, uh, their chemical potentials. Uh, on this side, we just have pure A. Here we have A that's been had its chemical potential decreased by being uh, by having the by having the impurity, but it's increased by having the pressure, and eventually those two those two uh, effects will equal each other. So what we want to know is how chemical potential is a function of concentration of B. That's the goal here, is to find this expression. So we redraw that sketch. So we've got the, the pure side, the original pressure, and the solvent, the, the solution, which is not pure, oops, which is not pure, at the new pressure, P plus pi. The pressure has been raised by this osmotic pressure, pi. And they're at equilibrium. So we can say mu A pure at the original pressure is equal to mu A not pure at the new pressure. 
Okay, and then we have to take into account both the facts that it's impure and that it's at the new pressure. Let's do the impurity first. So what we could do is say, all right, how is it changed by being impure? It's changed by a term RT log of XA as our that's our standard uh, ideal solution adjustment factor, right? That if we go from being pure to impure, we have our chemical potential decreased by that amount, okay? So this says we're impure, so we that's the same as being pure plus this term. Now we wanna somehow get rid of this, this, we have to figure out how the effective pressure is. And for that, we look at how chemical potential varies with pressure. And we know that it's a function of the Mohr volume. So we could write this, since we're working at constant temperature, temperature is not really a variable here, so we can write d mu is equal to the Mohr volume, d mu of A is equal to the Mohr volume of A dp. And so I can integrate from mu at the original pressure to mu at the new pressure, which is p plus pi. And we're gonna go from the original pressure to the new pressure, which is p plus pi. When we do that, we get mu at the new pressure, p plus pi, is equal to mu at the old pressure, p, plus the Mohr volume of A times the delta P plus pi minus P, or just pi. Okay, now we can take that up here and we can plug this adjustment factor in up here. So we have the chemical potential. So we're just gonna rewrite the left-hand side of pure stuff at the original pressure is equal to the chemical potential of pure stuff at the original pressure plus the Mohr volume times A, the Mohr volume of A times, times P, plus RT log of XA. So notice what we've done here. We said, okay, on the left, on the right hand side, we're in a new pressure and we're in pure. So this part takes care of the fact that we're not pure, and this part takes care of the fact that the pressure is increased by an amount pi. And once we do that, we say, oh, these are the same thing. We can cross them off. We can cancel them and leaving zero. So zero is equal to the Mohr volume of A times pi plus RT log of XA. And then we can then solve for pi. We can get pi is just going to be equal to, the osmotic pressure pi is just going to be RT log XA over the Mohr volume of our solvent, A. And let's go ahead and rewrite this on the next page really quickly. So we get pi is equal to minus RT log of XA over the Mohr volume of A. And we did assume ideal solution behavior when we wrote this, or when we derived this, so we better write that here. This is for ideal solutions. But you'll notice, wait a minute, this isn't what you learned in Gen Chem, right? This is, this is clearly not a linear expression, and you learned this simple linear expression in general chemistry. Let's see if we can simplify this. Well, the general chemistry expression assumes that the solutions dilute. We're gonna use this assumption a couple of times to, to get to the general chem exp uh, expression. So, if it's dilute, what we're gonna do is first we'll express the concentration in terms of the solute, Xb. And when we do that, we'll say, okay, oh, we'll use that series approximation we used before, right? If Xb is really small, then we can say that this is minus RT, and then we have minus Xb. And that's going to, those negative signs will cancel. So we get pi is equal to RT XB over the Mohr volume of A. And we can rewrite this as RT NB over the total moles. 
and the total moles are approximately going to be equal to the moles of A. Let's go ahead and write that as an approximation because the solution is so dilute, most of the moles are coming from the solvent. So if the total moles are approximately the moles of A, we get this. Well, if we multiply the more volume of A times the moles of A, we get the total volume. So we get pi is equal to RT times the moles of B over V, or you could write it as pi V equals nRT, which is kind of interesting. It looks like the ideal gas law. Or you could divide both sides by V. Uh, you divide both sides by V, and we get moles of B over the total volume. Or, of course, we could write that as just the concentration of B times RT. And this is the expression you learned in general chemistry. Note that it's only valid if you have not just an ideal solution, uh, which we have to do even for our expression, but also one that's extremely dilute. Right? Otherwise, this approximation we made getting rid of the logarithm, and this approximation over here won't work. Okay.